Good afternoon, Dr. It's a big pleasure to be here and uh, particularly thankful to Professor Kaminsky, Professor Zik for the presentation and also the opportunity to be here in Kiev. For me, is the second visit of this uh, country and I have uh, friends, I have also students that uh, have been attending uh, the school uh, in Florence and in Perugia. So I have many friends nowadays. So for me, it's particularly uh, pleasure to be here today. As you can see, you can follow my slides in uh, Russian language. And uh, um, today I will address uh, uh, the issue and try to uh, give you some uh, at least the basic uh, uh, tools uh, relative to the prediction of prevention of perturbed birth based uh, particularly on the latest uh, international guidelines. Um, this is working. So, the two guidelines I'm referring are very, very new. The one is going online next week and are the third edition of the European guidelines on paternal birth management. And there's been a, a group of experts, as you can see here, uh, that have uh, produced these guidelines based on uh, the latest findings related to uh, spontaneous pattern birth. The second uh, guidelines are based on the recent FIGO advice, which has been produced by a specific working group called Good Practice in Maternal Fetal Medicine. Also in this working group, uh, there are uh, very uh, renowned international experts. And these uh, uh, guidelines have been uh, just produced uh, uh, in the International Journal of Gynecology of State, which is the official journal of FIGO, and uh, we produced last year. So, both guidelines you can download free from the two journals. Uh, the Journal of Maternal Fit and Natal Medicine from uh, next week, and uh, uh, the International Journal already published. Now, coming now to the uh, issue that we discussed today, one of the most difficult things when we are dealing with the preterm birth is that we are still uncertain about uh, who initiates the labor, labor at term. And we presume that the same mechanism of labor at term are applied early for some reason that we try now to at least elucidate. Although we know more about the mechanism of labor, there are still uh, many studies that uh, uh, need to be done, especially in the area of uh, uh, genetics, factors, the signal between the mother and the fetus which initiate the labor, anatomic changes of the cervix uh, and uh, which is the role of the placenta, the fact that uh, the initiation labor looks like an inflammatory process, okay, many cytokines, prostaglandin, rising, so on. And finally, that there is uh, this mechanism of dysfunction or meta metabolism, which uh, is coupled with the apoptosis of tissue, which is like a timing by which uh, uh, at certain time labor should start. But of course, uh, this uh, pathways which uh, provoke uh, uh, the earlier activation of the mechanism has been summarized at least in big five areas of, uh, let's say, the pathophysiology, which are the uh, infection inflammation, which is probably is the single most important cause, ultimate cause of preterm birth, cervical factors, Uteroplacental hypoxia, bleeding, or thrombosis. Uterine overdistension, like it happens in uh, multiple pregnancy or when there are malformation of the uterus. And, of course, maternal fetal endocrine or paracrine activation. So, the 
pathogenesis of this, uh, which is not a disease really, but is a timing, early timing of uh, interruption of pregnancy, can be recognized uh, as a risk factor much earlier than pregnancy itself. If we look uh, to the characteristics of some women, we may define which are the women, which even before having you know, the capability to remain pregnant, have no risk factor which uh, shorten the pregnancy length. And uh, these risk factors are, as we know, mainly represented by genetics, family trends, by the age, too early or too late in the reproductive uh, uh, period, by reproductive system or medical disorders in that particular woman, by the fact that previous pregnancy was ending preterm, by environmental factors, which have been mentioned also by Professor Sheet about uh, diet, nutrition, and so on. And uh, all these factors, at the end, they uh, increase uh, all these, uh, uh, let's say, five major pathways, stress, cervical insufficiency, overdistension, ischemia, inflammation, infection, which ultimate uh, activate mechanism of labor, which everybody knows, which are uh, uterine contraction, cervical ripening, and absorbed membranes. So we know that uh, even before pregnancy, some women are not able to bring pregnancy at the end. And uh, it is interesting very recently, and as we mentioned also by Professor Schick, that uh, there are some disorders which have uh, particularly uh, uh, titrating the woman in a wrong way for reproduction. For example, polycystic ovary disease. You know, uh, Frida Kahlo is uh, one icon of this disease. Frida Kahlo had nine miscarriages, never get uh, a baby at the end. Second mis second trimester miscarriage, she has diabetes and so on, and polycystic ovary syndrome. And uh, along with uh, diabetes, the risk of gestational diabetes of this woman, there is a high risk uh, of spontaneous pertemper. And the other, uh, and this uh, polycystic ovary syndrome, you know, is an increasing disease in our population, in our time. And the other important one is endometriosis. We just mentioned this, but uh, we see more women with endometriosis for several reasons. One, because uh, we are postponing pregnancy later. So the manifestation, clinical manifestation of endometriosis are coming out. Because if you have a pregnancy 20 years old, probably you block the clinical manifestation of endometriosis. But if you wait until 35, the clinical manifestation, pain and so on, can come up. Secondly, we have uh, much better diagnostic tools, and uh, we know that endometriosis is linked with the autoimmune imbalance, and immunity has a major role in maintaining pregnancy length. Therefore, if we look at uh, uh, women with endometriosis who overcome the infertility, which is uh, associated with endometriosis, and became pregnant, uh, have a major risk to have a shorter pregnancy. And of course now everybody speaks about epigenetics because it's very popular to speak about this activation of genes on off of the genes I have. But this explains why I can modulate my genes with a diet, with a lifestyle, particularly when uh, I have uh, derangements in my lifestyle which are you know, abuse of smoke, abuse of alcohol, drugs, and uh, unbalance in the diet. And nowadays the unbalance in the diet is very, very common, unfortunately. Because we are imitating the Western, uh, let's say, uh, diet, which unfortunately is bringing a lot of problems uh, in the uh, maintaining of our good genetic uh, traits. And finally, as I said, uh, the most important uh, single cause is uh, the ascending infection.
from the cervical canal of bacteria which are in the vagina of the cervix. But what is important is not uh, uh, the presence of bacteria itself, is the reaction, inflammatory reaction to the presence of bacteria. So to find uh, some bacteria in the vagina that colonize vagina doesn't mean that there is a specific risk, but is the reaction of the mucosa or the woman, let's say, and the environment which create the risk. And some bacteria have the capabilities also to overcome the mucus uh, protection because they possess mucinases and silidases, enzymes that uh, go over the mucus, which is the biggest protection in the woman between the out and the in of the abdomen, and they can create uh, what we call chorioamelonitis, an inflammation of the fetal membranes and decidua, and you know that fetal membrane decidua are the producer of all the prostaglandins that the woman need to maintain labor. So all the labor at term normally needs an amount of prostaglandin to create contraction of the uterus and to modify the cervix, and these prostaglandins are produced by chorion and residual. Now, the inflammation of this tissue activates the prostaglandins early, and therefore, this is uh, probably the reason why inflammation and infection are the major cause of spontaneous fetal birth. Finally, I think that the role of the placenta has to be reassessed. As far as uh, nowadays, we always thought that the placenta is a, uh, let's say, a neutral organ, similar either if I have a boy or a girl in the womb. But the last four or five years has clarified that the placenta is quite different between boys and girls. And if you see here, the male placenta has a target only to pass fuel, oxygen, substances to create a bigger boy. And this is the reason why probably the boys are bigger than the girl, at least at 300 grams on average. Although, if you look, the X, the Y chromosome, the Y chromosome of the boy is eight times smaller of the X chromosome of the girls. So why so little DNA is capable to make so big boys while so X big chromosomes are not able to do that? Because women are smarter. They say, okay, let the boy grow up, but we are much more safer. And in fact, the placenta of the female is more protective, doesn't allow to cross bacteria, virus, and so on. And if you look, the majority of, uh, uh, let's say, affection by cytomegalovirus, Zika virus, and so on, affecting more the boys than the girls in utero. Not only, but if there is an infection, boys have higher prematurity rate than girls. So at the end of the day, the placenta of a female is creating a nicely growing girl, very well protected. On the other side, we are growing up fast, a big boy, but very weak. Okay? And with a higher incidence of prematurity. Because the incidence of prematurity, if you have a boy, in the uterus is twice as much as girl. And this is the difference of the placenta in boy and girl. We have to think now that this difference makes a big difference in the result of pregnancy. You know that now it's quite clear that if you're a boy in the womb, you have two major risks as a mother to develop gestational diabetes and to have a preterm labor. So it's not a bigger tool to have a boy, it's better to have a girl, <laughs> for the mother point of view. Now, 
Same and setting the uh, scenario, which is changing, as you can see, let's look uh, at uh, the prediction and which are the risk factors. Of course, uh, risk factors change uh, country by country. Here is a table, very complicated, but to show you that the last 10 years there are 20 interesting epidemiological studies going from 10 to 500,000 women evaluating pregnancy to look which are the risk factors for preterm birth. And you can see that uh, neither of these studies have looked to the same risk factors. Some are dealing with uh, prior preterm birth, uh, other the risk of uh, preeclampsia, diabetes, uh, smoking, maternal age, uh, and so on and so on. So it's very difficult to make a picture, also because some of the studies are in Europe, some are in South America, some in North America, and the, the risk factor changes. The only free risk factor which are not changing everywhere in the world are previous pregnant birth, twin pregnancy, and the short service. But the rest is very fluctuating. And uh, there are new risk factors coming up which we have to consider. For instance, nowadays more women in reproductive age survive even if they were born very small. Preterm. You know, the prematurity, uh, let's say natality in the past, was linked with the mortality. But nowadays we have developed good neonatologists. You know, neonatologists have been developed by obstetrician like Eva from Adam, from a rib. The rib of the obstetrician became a neonatologist. Otherwise, if you don't give it to neonatologists more baby, what they do? Nothing. Because in the past, newborn were pertaining to midwife and to obstetrician. But then when we were able to make survive more newborn early, then we have to create the specialty of neonatology. Hmm? Now, that more, uh, more small baby survive and became uh, uh, in reproductive age. However, we have to think that this baby has three times more the chance to have a spontaneous paternal birth when they are pregnant. So there is a genetic trend. The second, uh, as I said, uh, this is one of the statistics which I produced when I made the first study published 10 years ago in which I associate the male sex to pretend birth, you can see that looking at the statistics in Sweden, I found this big difference. And then I make a study also in my department, and I found that uh, all the newborn, born pretend spontaneously, 62% were boys. Of course, it's very difficult to give an explanation, but some of the explanation can come from the different placenta. The third uh, big issue in uh, modern days uh, is uh, work. All women in reproductive age are not anymore the housewife of the past. They want to work, they go, you know, to maintain a family, they want to have a success in career, so they postpone pregnancy, but at the same time they may have work that can be dangerous. Particularly there are three kinds of work which are particularly dangerous. Those with prolonged standings, more than six hours a day, those with heavy lifting, and those with the long working hours. This uh, comes from a study we did in Europe 10 years ago on 17,000 women we follow up for one year. 17,000. And uh, we found that uh, these uh, three major, uh, at least uh, in the modern working environment, are the major effect uh, for decreasing pregnancy length twice as much. And of course, uh, in that year, we uh, spoke about uh, many other factors, also psychological factors, we may affect pregnancy length, and we call them psychosocial stress. You can see there are many of them, uh, to be unmarried, uh, to be uncohabiting with a partner, to be uh, having this working condition which I just mentioned, educational level, so on. All these are increasing at least twice as much a risk that the pregnancy will be short. Professor Schick mentioned also the result of IVF. 
And it's important to know that IDF is not increasing only as in the, you know, uh, mass media, that you have more chance to have a twin. But okay, there are more chances to have twins, and of course, if we have twins, we have more chance to have a spontaneous spontaneous birth. But also, with a singleton, and this is just one of many studies produced, it's quite clearly, that if you have an IVF or in a pregnancy from assisted reproductive technology, you have twice as more the chance of spontaneous paternal birth. And this should be in the counseling of this woman. Finally, this is data which come from my study in Italy on 10,000 pregnancy. We have shown for first that, you can see in the last line in red, previous cesarean section is another bigger risk factor of spontaneous paternal birth in a subsequent pregnancy. Nowadays, the cesarean rate is increasing a lot. Okay, think about that if you do a cesarean section in a patient which is 42 years old, after six years of infertility, and you do an IVF and she remains pregnant, okay, if you do a cesarean section, probably she has concluded her reproductive career. But if you do a cesarean section in 22 years old lady, or she wants more baby, then you should know that you increase to her three times the chance to have a spontaneous preterm birth in a subsequent pregnancy. And this is a study which has been confirmed by many, many other afterwards. I think that, uh, however, very recently we have uh, just published the biggest study ever done in uh, middle to high income countries related to the risk factor prematurity. Four million women evaluated. Four million. 130 parameters evaluated. So it took us six months to look at the statistics, and we published uh, six months ago the study. And you can see here from this data the four countries giving all the database to elaborate the data were Czech Republic, New Zealand, Slovenia, Sweden, because they have very good database. And we can look to many, many factors. And you can see that we have a very long confirmation. Pre or preterm birth is the, probably the highest risk factor, as well uh, preeclampsia, diabetes, age of the mother, but you see also the sex of the fetus is another important factor. But even though you see difference in this uh, likelihood ratio, the odd ratio, so called, one is six, the other is one point two, you have to balance about the respective frequency of the risk factor. The frequency to have a male is much higher of frequency to have a pre birth. So even though the frequency of the main is 1.2, the final effect of the main sex is much higher on overall preterm birth rate of to have a previous preterm birth. Okay? And this is something that we will consider in the end. So this is uh, the picture of what we have nowadays in the world as risk factor. But the risk factor probably are not enough. If we have a woman with this factor and she comes with some, let's say, clinical symptoms, and the clinical symptoms can be pain in the womb, some kind of discharge, and so on, the most of the time so far we have classified this woman at risk or not, of course, according to gestational age, but the most of the time we admit this woman in the hospital. Because we evaluate very subjectively, okay? We believe, okay, she has pain, so come to the hospital, I give you tocolytics, I give you corticosteroids, because we have to avoid the risk of prematurity. And we know that in more than 60% of cases, we are completely doing a wrong uh, management. Because this patient will never deliver preterm. In many studies, more than 60% of patients will present the symptoms and they have an even risk factor don't uh, deliver people. So we need to, uh, at least to help uh, the clinical opinion with a more sound objective data. And the biomarkers and the biophysical markers have been 
developed in the last uh, 10 to 20 years. The most uh, uh, studied are, from the biochemical point of view, fibronectin and uh, this PMG1 molecule, which was discovered by a Russian 15 years ago, and of course, the evaluation of a cervix by ultrasound, okay, which has been shown to be much more reliable than our uh, capability to be good obstetrician, good clinician. Short cervix means uh, to uh, measure the cervix in special in particular condition, very easy, training should be done, however, and the most important is the measure. Don't look at the, all the other parameters because all the other parameters don't add too much to the risk. Okay? But what is important to know is that there is a general consensus that if the service is more than 2.5 cm, that is very unlikely that the woman will deliver. But if it's shorter than 1.5 cm, then the woman is at high risk. This is the conclusion of measuring uh, by ultrasound the cervix. More recently, I just mentioned, there is another uh, marker in the cervix, which is the angle between uh, the cervix and the corpus of the uterus. If the angle is acute, the risk, uh, even though the cervix is short, is much less than if the angle is ob obtuse. The data coming from this very well done interesting study show that uh, there is twice as much the risk to deliver preterm in a week if the cervix is short and obtuse versus the uterine cord. Okay? Why? The difference is if it's acute. But overall, if I measure only the cervix, this is one of our study, the negative predictive value, so the value over 2.5 is very good in being negative, so in excluding patient to be at risk. But the shorter value, the positive predictive value, so the identification of patient who really need our treatment is very low, 30%. Means that when I have a shorter cervix, in 70% in of cases I treat if I want to treat patients which don't need it. Okay? So, new markers have been uh, put forward. Fibronectin is the most studied, 20 years of history of fibronectin. Fibronectin is a, a clue between the fetal membranes and the decidua. It doesn't appear in the vaginal uh, fluid or disappear around 20 weeks and appear only at term. So, in the period in which we identify preterm, fibronectin is not present in the vaginal fluid. And if we found the fibronectin vaginal fluid, this means that something happens in the fetal membranes, usually activation of labor. However, there are two methods to measure fibronectin. One is a bedside, a stick, yes or no, present or, or not present. The other is a quantitative methodology. We have uh, experience with this quantitative methodology because you can subdivide uh, the fibronectin concentration in five uh, at least uh, classes according to the amount uh, that you find in the cervicovaginal fluid. And according to this, uh, we did a study of 160 uh, pregnancy before 30 weeks to predict how many will deliver in a week or after 34 weeks, you can see there is a very linear correlation. More fibronectin, more is the risk. Are we improving our capability of detection of this patient? So and so, better than ultrasound, yes. But if I use this method alone, I have a very good negative again, predictive value, but the positive predictive value is no more than 40%. So we improve a little from ultrasound, but not too much. What is interesting is that three years ago, examining a new marker, I did a multicenter trial with a, a, a group in Macedonia and a group in Moscow, and my group in Perugia, we identified this uh, protein and we found that this has a much higher 
positive predictive value. Double then fadonectin and ultrasound. So after this preliminary study, we did a, a comparison between the three methodology, fadonectin, ultrasound, and PMG1, which is called now Pato Shoot. You can see that they are very similar on the negative predictive value, but they are much different in the positive one, being PMG1 the best by far. Nowadays there are other five studies and one more just released published in Obstetric and Ecology last week of a multicenter American trial which confirmed that the PMG1 has around 80% of positive predictive value. Means that if I have a patient which arrives with the symptoms uh, irrespective of the cervical length and the PMG1 is positive, 88 of these patients over 10 will deliver in a week. 8 over 10. So I have to admit them and to treat because the prematurity issue is very, uh, very important. Of course, uh, the negative predictive value remains very high. So if this protein is negative, then I can be quiet and reassure the patient and send her home. If I combine with a cervical length, the efficacy of the combination is even better because I detect 100% of patients with deliver the type. Between short cervix and positive PMG1, in a week all the patients deliver. There is no false out of this, false positive. What this means in clinical terms? Just to give you an idea, if I use a fibronectin, I will exclude a lot of patients, but still I will treat 70% of them unnecessarily, of those who remain positive, who in any case is a, a much smaller population. But if I use this test, I will over-treat only 20 to 30% of patients, which means that in terms of money, very good saving of money. But what is more important is what has been done in this uh, uh, English hospital and published recently. They use uh, for the first six months of a year one test, and for the second six months another test. And they show that the admission of the hospital has dropped 40% with a better test. So in your hospital, you may optimize the admission of patients at the risk of preterm birth using better tests. And this may be important on economics of health. So the general guidelines coming from uh, the European uh, uh, society and the FIGO is that this test uh, should be used and uh, take their negative predictive value on average they are good, either ultrasound, either fibronectin, either PMG1, but when we are going to the positive predictive value, the best is by far PMG1. And of course, you can see that the advantages may be not only for the hospital and for the cost benefit, but also for the patient, because the patient is not admitted to the hospital, that uh, is not considered a sick patient, and uh, of course, there is less burden for the family, especially when uh, patients are in a small countryside, and because uh, they are supposed to be at the risk of prematurity, they are transferred to an hospital in another faraway city. So the conclusion of this part is, uh, and these are the conclusion of uh, our guidelines, is that we need uh, to identify this patient, we need to look to new risk factor, and the risk factor are also to be evaluated in different countries because the lifestyle of the country is different from the other, diet and so on, and if we need to identify patient, consider this combination of ultrasound and biochemical markers. Let me move now to what we can do, because if we may identify the patient because they are at the risk, are we able nowadays to prevent in this patient at risk the real risk of prematurity? I think that it's quite clear that, as I told you, that the only risk factors which are amenable of uh, prevention worldwide 
since they are worldwide recognized, is uh, prior fetal birth, twin pregnancy, and short cervix uh, at scan. And let me say that uh, what are the tools that nowadays we have uh, more or less validated or we are still discussing. And I would say that uh, we have not much fantasy in uh, obstetrics. I mean, we are proposing progesterone, discovered 1930, Sir Clage proposed 100 years ago, and the Pesari proposed 65 years ago. Wow. Very modern uh, tools, really. <laughs> but of course, <laughs> you know, history of medicine is uh, telling us that uh, there is a lot of learning curve for how methodology of the past can be reused nowadays. Let me explain why these three can be important in the prevention. Progesterone, you will hear a little already by Professor Gicke, now from uh, Dr. Pieti, has um, four major roles in pregnancy which are affecting pregnancy length. Maternal immune response, for instance, avoiding abortion. Suppressed inflammatory response. It is one very potent antiprostaglandin drug progesterone. Many don't know that it is acting against prostaglandin, particularly blocking cyclocosigenes. Reduce uterine contractility. Only natural progesterone can do that because it acts on the nitric oxide system and block completely contractility of the uterus. It's a slow activity, cannot be used as an emergency action, but it is blocking contractility. And improve the uterus center circulation. Of course, circulation is very well known. It works as in a stitch that we put in the cervix and it has been introduced by Shirokar, the Indian surgeon, who thought that he could avoid the so-called cervical incompetence. Although it is 100 years that we discuss what is cervical incompetence, because nobody has done really an agreement on what is cervical incompetence, but nowadays we think that the cervical incompetence is when a woman has at least two previous second trimester abortion or two previous preterm birth. And then, in that case, uh, we'll see if a cervical circulation will work. And finally, the Pessary. Pessary was introduced by a German gynecologist called Arabi in this specific uh, shape, which is different from the other. Don't think that it's the same, the same Pessary used for prolapse or for other reasons. This uh, is a very, uh, let's say, uh, high piece of, uh, uh, of plastic, a specific plastic, with uh, the capability to have uh, an open uh, uh, ring which allow the discharge of, uh, of the cervical uh, you know, fluid. But probably the action of the, uh, the pessary is given by modifying the angle between cervix and the body of the uterus. And this has been shown by a study. You see that the cervical inclination, when I put the pessary, changes and it became more acute than before. And this has been done with the Manessi reference. So, the finding that women will have an obtuse angle between the cervix and the body of the uterus are more risk of paternal birth, but the pessary can change to acute. This is probably one of the reasons why pessary may work. And you can see here the different uh, uh, picture of changes from an angle obtuse to an angle which is more acute. Let's now evaluate for each of these three tools and our risk patient what are the results in the general literature of the world. Women with a previous pertemper. There is only one substance which may work, and this is uh, progesterone. The progesterone user is either the natural vaginal progesterone, either the 17 hydroxy progesterone caproate. There is uh, more than 36 randomized controlled trials nowadays 
on progesterone. But if we look at the difference between the intramuscular vagina, there are a couple of studies which confirm that the vaginal progesterone is more effective and there is less adverse effects. What means less adverse effects? If you give a 17-hydroxyprogesterone caprate to your woman, okay, you give one intramuscular injection per week. But you should know that you increase three times the risk of gestational diabetes. Okay? This has been confirmed by a trial which has been published one week ago, also in the American Journal. So we have to be clear with the, our patient if they choose a, let's say, more demanding way of putting the vaginal progesterone each night compared to one single injection every week, they may have major risk later on. Prophylactic circulation is completely unuseful for a previous preterm birth unless we have more than two previous preterm birth or two recurrent miscarriages. Only maternal mortality, morbidity increase if I put a circulation. These are many studies which have been shown. Now we go to the short cervix because short cervix is a very debatable issue. First, what means short cervix? I say the consensus is 2.5 cm. Now everybody agrees with 2.5 cm. But the causes of why 2.5 cm is short or less are many. Can be because there is a progesterone deficit, or because of the intrinsic weakness, or because of the poor cervical perfusion, or because we have uh, operated the cervix previously for HPV, for uh, a, a intranoplastic cancer, and so on. So the treatment can be different according to the different etiology, but unfortunately, a lot of time is so difficult to understand which is the etiology. We don't know. We don't have, for instance, uh, any mean to evaluate uh, the softness of the cervix reliably. The only mean that I evaluate the softness of the cervix is my finger, if I visit the patient. But, okay, my finger is different by his finger, the finger is off. So I may be soft 50% and I can say, no, for me 20% is so. off. We have a sophisticated method coming up, but we need a still to validate. But I'm quite sure that, for instance, if there is a problem of perfusion, aspirin can work. And you know that nowadays, the last trial which has been done on 3,000 patients to prevent preeclampsia, giving aspirin from the first trimester, not only succeed in obtaining a decrease of preeclampsia in the risk patient, but they decrease also the term birth rate. So this means that aspirin works in some way. Also preventing the term birth, but probably in some condition. So again, the angle, acute or obtuse, make a difference for probably the action of pessary. And this is the first study in which pessary has been shown to work to prevent in singletons Birth, but unfortunately, soon after, another English study showed there is not too much merit because there, there was a big difference, no difference between pessary and opessary. I should say that the protocol of this study was a little bit weak. First, no training to doctors, so anybody was put in the pessary as they think that he can put, but this pessary is different from the other. We need some training to put this pessary. And secondly, in this study, by the FMF, pessary was put at least a four to six weeks later than the other study, and it can make a difference. Circulate, short cervix, doesn't work. Randomized control trial, don't attempt. You can do an emergency circulate, but this is another matter. So with the short cervix, the circulate doesn't work. What about the progesterone? These are the major study, and I underline red the most important because there are more patients and of course the English and the American study together have the same result, 45% reduction not only of preterm birth rate but also, which is more important, of the uh, baby outcome and even though uh, we have heard about the optimum study which was uh, 
you know, including patients uh, either with a short service, either with a private return, either with a, uh, other risk factors, and they were not conclusive in the use of progesterone because probably the risk factors are many and the progesterone work better in some. When I extrapolate from this study optimum, the 260 patients, the short service, and I put in meta-analysis with the other, again, it's confirmed that there is a merit to give progesterone when I found the short service. And this is very important. What about the 17 hydroxy caporate? No action at all. So there is no indication to use uh, intramuscular progesterone. Finally, twin pregnancy. Twin pregnancy, circulation. Because everybody thinks, oh, there are twins, so let's, twins, let's close better the, the, the cervix. Never know that maybe, you know, like a package. If I have a big package with a lot of bread, better that put a more stick to close. This doesn't work in nature, at least in human nature, because it has been shown that it's worse than bad to put a cervix into your brains. About uh, the effectiveness of progestogens, the meta-analysis show a merit in giving progesterone, particularly now when there is a short service. There is nowadays a just release uh, uh, study, big meta-analysis of uh, five randomized control trial, in which you see that if we give progesterone in twins with the short cervix, we ameliorate the outcome of the newborn. We don't prolong too much pregnancy, only a few days. But of course, it's natural. With the two babies, it's very difficult to prolong pregnancy up to the end. And what for? There is no need to arrive to 40 weeks of twins. It's more dangerous. It's been shown that in twins, after 37, the risk of cerebral palsy increases instead of going down, like in singletons. In singletons, cerebral palsy or damage increase after 41 weeks. But in twins, start going up at 37. So the best week to deliver twins is already nearby the preterm age. But what we can do is that giving progesterone, we decrease neonatal morbidity and mortality. What about the pessary? This is probably the best study, which has been published a few months ago in the American Journal. In twins, if we put the pessary early in pregnancy, there is some merit at the end, there you see. And probably this is one of the best studies that uh, at least induce other to confirm at least this data. There is quite clearly some, uh, let's say, niche indication of pessary. For instance, if we use we have monochorionic twinning and we do laser therapy, putting a pessary before laser therapy prevents major preterm birth in this population, as you can see from this study. And of course, the outcome of the baby is better when I put the pessary because I prolong pregnancy in these cases. So the conclusion the implication is that pessary has some merit because it is, of course, you put once only, uh, as a cost which is not particularly high, but we need to do more randomized control trial, at least to show that in twins uh, has a very big uh, tool. So the conclusion of, uh, and this is a very last conclusion that came from the European guidance we we'll publish ne uh, next week, are very important because European experts say that, uh, okay, if there is a prior history of preterm birth, uh, we can there is evidence that 17 hydroxy and natural micronized work. But be careful because with 17 hydroxy you increase gestational diabetes. Okay? Secondly, if we have a short cervix, only micronized progesterone should be given because it's the only one that works. And third, if you have twins, you can give progesterone in short cervix twins. Because it works in diminishing neonatal mortality morbidity. These are the recent guidelines from Europe, and I think that are very important to take into consideration. So let me conclude with a, uh, a sort of, uh, let's say, puzzle which I put together. We nowadays have uh, 
free tools which may ameliorate. Although they are older, we have uh, revisited them in a modern way. Progesterone, circlift, tester. Maybe others are coming up are understand. But in order to implement these tools, we have to implement ultrasound screening of this patient and implement the use of some specific markers. This implies more education and counseling. This implies to consider that this is a best practice in our profession. This implies that our patients have access of care. And this implies, ultimately, that our politician, our health officer, understand that this is a good cost-benefit for a nation, and we should apply this more widely and apply program of intervention. And I think that this has been demonstrated already by three major cost-benefit studies, two in the United States and one in an European country, showing that by far, if I do cervical screening and I give progesterone, I save a lot of money in diminishing enough uh, preterm births at the end. But I would like to come back to our big study of the 4 million women. As I said before, there are high individual risk factors which have a lower population prevalence, let's say prior preterm birth, hypertension and so on. But there are low individual risk factors which have very higher population prevalence, and this is uh, education, fetal male sex, BMI, okay, obesity, and uh, maternal age. And of course, this uh, is very difficult to explain. It's very difficult to apply prevention. I cannot change the sex of a baby, of course, even there is a risk, and the baby remains male. So, my interventional area, if I use uh, the clinical practice, practice the social intervention, for instance, with the progesterone, implementation, ultrasound, the stop smoking, and so on, we probably diminished one third of the preterm birth. And need to study still why there are reasons for two thirds to continue to be. You know that uh, very recently WHO and Figo have uh, made a joint uh, consideration that probably we cannot go down less than 4.5% in preterm birth rate in the world. 4.5%. But countries that have 9, 10%, USA has 12%. They should do something. Because this means that 7% of the old pregnancy can be prevented if we can go down to 4.5%. Okay? 4.5 is a limit that we probably we cannot change. So, I think that uh, I give you a, a picture of this, uh, 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 let's say, tool nowadays. I hope that I give you some consideration that can be useful for your practice and I'm open for any question later on after the next speaker. Thank you very much.